Welcome to the Virginia Education Center for Asphalt Technology. This is the VDOT material certification class for slurry surfacing and in this module we're going to talk about inspection and the quality assurance program. During this module what we hope to get through is one, what is the responsibilities of the inspector on that project, how to construct proper joints both the longitudinal and the transverse joint, Know the specs and inspection points for slurry seal paving. Know the same specs and inspection points for the latex modified or micro surfacing. How to determine the pay items for slurry surfacing mixes. And then finally understand the components of the QA program. So what are you trying to do as an inspector? What are our objectives? One, we want to make sure whatever we're laying this slurry on or this latex on that it's been properly prepared. If it's been patched out, any irregularities corrected. We want to make sure that the correct equipment is being used. There's requirements within these specs and special provisions for the type of requirement used to pave and to roll to pave the material. Uh, we need to make sure that the material is delivered within specs. We need to make sure that the proper paving equipment is there to perform, perform the work. And then we want to make sure that the QA program is actually executed correctly. In your manual, you can see what is the basic responsibilities of construction inspection. Whether you're working for VDOT or as a consultant to VDOT, you are a representative of the owner. So you're the one who's ensuring that those specs that are written out and that are in that contract document are actually being fulfilled. So you're making sure the road and bridge specs as well as any of the special provisions in that contract are being fulfilled properly. And you're also making sure that the parts of the QA program is actually being executed. So first, to get you a good feel for the specs and how they work, we're going to go through a quick spec exercise. You have these specs in your booklet, so you need to open them up and flip through them to answer the following questions. Want to know what section in these specs and what's the minimum type of a, uh, amount of type B slurry seal application rate, so where in the spec do you find it? What's the minimum storage capacity for a latex modified emulsion treatment continuous uh, mixing machine? So how big or how small can it be? When do you need pneumatic tires? What's the maximum overlap for both a slurry and for a latex? What is the temperatures when you need to use a fog seal and why you would do it? And how is a latex modified emulsion treatment paid for? So we're going to take the next few minutes, look through those specs, look through the special provisions, and answer these six questions. All right, let's see how well you did. Where do we find it? Well, first you got to look in the emulsified asphalt slurry seal special provision. And this is in section four under procedures and under D, rate of application. So that's where you find out what's the minimum amount of type B slurry seal application rate. And as you read that, it says it's 16 pounds per square yard. So that's what a type B slurry seal requires is a minimum application rate. What's the minimum storage capacity? If you open up the special provision for latex modified emulsion treatment, you'll see that it's five tons. So that piece of equipment has to hold at least five tons of material. When do we require a pneumatic tire roller on microsurfacing? When's it required? It says right in the language, if excess aggregate loss is observed. So this is a visual inspection by the inspector as well as by the contractor. Do I need to put a pneumatic tire roller on that latex or on that microsurfacing? What is the maximum overlap? There is no maximum for emulsified slurry seal. There's nothing defined within the spec, but for latex, it's very clear. It says a four inch maximum. So you'll find that in the special provisions. When do you come in and put a fog seal and why do you do it? Well, when the pavement temperature is 90 degrees or higher, you'll apply this light fogging of water and you're doing it to prevent the quick breaking of the emulsion. So when that emulsion sprayed, if the te pavement temperature is very hot, the water and the asphalt break quickly and it sets up too fast. So you're spraying water to cool that surface down just enough 
to slow the setting. And then how does latex modified emulsion treatment paid for? We pay for it by the ton. So hopefully now you've got a feel for how the specs work. If you have any questions, just stop and ask a facilitator or stop and look in your books, but all this information's in your specifications. It's important to know how your specs work because many of these contracts that have latex or it has a slurry seal, they are part of a maintenance schedule, a paving schedule. And in these schedules, they contain a lot of special provisions and supplementals. They may contain a special provision copy note. So it's important to know what's most important because you have this contract document as well as you have standard drawings and standard specs. If you look at section 512 of the spec book, it tells you what's important from least to most. Least important is your standard drawings. Not very common for these types of projects because we're only doing a maintenance overlay. We're not building something, putting in curb and gutter, building a bridge, what have you. But we do have standard specs and that's our spec book. So it talks about it. If you look in section 300, there are several different sections that deal with doing types of uh, overlays, types of uh, treatments. We use quite a few supplemental specifications. So those will be embedded in your document. If they're in there, they'll update what's your standard spec. So a supplemental language always trumps a standard spec. There's pro possibility these contracts may have plans. And if they have plans, whatever is written in those plans, if it contradicts the supplemental or the standards, or even if there's a standard drawing, what's in those plans is more important. A lot of these projects will have special provisions, so they're standalone specifications for a certain activity. Whatever's written in those, if it contradicts what's anywhere from the plans all the way down to the standard drawings, special provisions rule. And then last but not least, we got special provision copy notes. And these copy notes, really, they adjust the special provision slightly. That might be for a certain district or for a certain residency. So you have to look at your contract, but the special provision copy notes are your highest level. On a lot of our uh, maintenance schedules, you'll see some general notes and other written information. Uh, they take the same precedent as plans in these types of no plan contracts. So if there's general notes or written information, they're usually considered the same as plans. But just remember, special provision copy notes is the highest level, so that is overrules everything, and your standard drawings are your lowest. So, if we're doing latex, we're doing slurry, we gotta know how often is testing done. And we need to Keep a few things in mind. We're going to talk about some lab stuff, but we'll also talk about some stuff that's done in the field. With asphalt content, we're using VTM 102 or 93 for actually determining the asphalt content of these mixes. For microsurfacing, we're doing one for every 500 tons of aggregate. So as we run through about 500 tons, we're doing a random sample in there, we're pulling a sample, taking it back to the lab and seeing what the asphalt content is. For slurry, we do it once in the first 25,000 square yards and then a minimum of every five or 50,000 square yards. So you can do it more frequently, but you got to do it at least within the first 25,000 and then by at least 50,000. For our consistency, so how consistent is this mixture? We follow the ISSA Bulletin 106 for cone test and we do a minimum of two tests per production day and it's performed during the test strip and production. So during our test strip, we wanna make sure that that slurry mixture is good and consistent. And then as we go through production during that day, we're doing a couple tests just to make sure that the mixture consistency is proper. Back in the lab, we can do a wet track abrasion test, which is following VTM 14. And we're to do it one test per day or each transport load. So moving from some of the tests, let's talk about what we're inspecting. What are you looking for to make sure you're getting a good quality product? So we're going to talk about the joints, the lines, some structures, what we need to be looking for, 
as well as things from texture and knowing the weather considerations and limitations. So with the joints, we should have minimal overlap. Type B and Type C slurries have larger aggregates, so if you have more overlap, that'll create more of a ridge or more of a hump. So we want to have minimal overlap on these slurry seals so we don't create a ridge. Microsurfacing, whether it's any of the types, no more than four inch. So we don't want that excessive overlap right at the longitudinal joints. So as they're pulling one lane and then they come to pull the lane next to it, we want to make sure we're riding right along that existing edge. Overlaps result in bleeding, displacement, and an uneven surface. So again, that's why we're trying to minimize it because you'll have a lot of liquid, a lot of material in a very small space. Transverse joints, we want to make sure that they're smooth because that's what the traveling public judges our roads on. We want to avoid doing any handwork because the more handwork you do, the more uh, becomes less aesthetically pleasing. The more you touch it, the more damage you can really do. So we want the equipment to do its work. And starting transverse joints on roofing felt can help eliminate joints. So you put the roofing felt down about three, four feet, you start pulling off, and then once you pull off, you pull that felt up and it'll make a nice, straight, smooth joint. So as you look at these pictures, do you see anything wrong when we look at them? Very clearly, look at where these joints are at. Very terrible job. Over here, looks a lot better, does it not? Here, we can see where this joint is. Notice how ragged it is. It's not very smooth. It's not at the center of the lane. It's offset. And then here, I'm not even sure what was happening to create the unevenness, why they're not going to the edge. Again, some problems that we want to avoid out on projects. Look at the mess. That's definitely what we don't want. But look at that. This is a nice transverse joint from a pull-off where the roofing felt was used. So just notice the differences in the quality of the work. Let's talk about edge lines. They need to be clean and straight. Notice some of those pictures where I showed the joints, how ragged and rough they were. Same with edge lines. You want them smooth, straight, aesthetically pleasing. Want them to go up to the edge of the travel surface or travel way. So they need to go over and terminate at a proper location. When we get the structure, so manholes, or manhole covers, uh, vaults, uh, drainage structures, we want to make sure we're protecting them. We want to make sure that we don't get any material into the drainage system. We don't want to pollute the waterways. And elevations on structures may or may not need to be adjusted. These aren't very thick overlays, but in some instances they may have to be adjusted depending on the road itself. With the texture, we want to make sure that the calibration is done properly so it comes out correctly behind it as it goes through the burlap drag. Failure to calibrate can yield mixtures with too high or too low of contents, whether it's cement or water. It can look black, it can flush, so those are things that you're looking for. You're looking for a nice uniform texture. Proper treatments have about 75% of that stone embedded. So as you go down the road and as the slurry comes out from the back, three quarters of that rock should be embedded in that asphalt emulsion. Thin treatment thicknesses with large aggregates will result in dragging. So going with a thin application rate, say if a type B or a type C has large rock in it, but it's too thin of an application, you'll get drag marks coming out from behind the drag. And smoothness and quality, or ride quality, because of the thickness and the nature of them, we're not really looking to improve ride that much. It really follows the existing surface. You can see some improvement on micro, but most of these treatments are meant for preventive maintenance purposes and not for improving rod quality. Let's watch this video as the crew goes down the road. And as you notice, as we go down the road, 
the gentlemen that are walking beside of it are just watching. They're not having to do any type of activities because we're pulling a nice straight joint. So you can see we're up against the curb and gutter or the gutter pan and we're having a nice longitudinal joint down the right side. Here's another project that's being done and again notice the lack of handwork, the nice drag behind this is a latex. You see continuous feed of the equipment. You can see here's the aggregate that's going in that will be mixed in with the emulsion. Here you can see the end of the tack and also you can see the felt paper. That is where that project overlay will end for that day. And a nice beautiful surface, nice texture, nice lines, just as the project was meant to look. However, if your mix is too stiff, you'll get this washboarding look and this washboarding effect going down the road. Bad ride quality, not a very good final surface. Some other things to look at is early traffic damage. Because it has an emulsion, it takes time for that binder and that water to separate, to set up, to harden. If traffic gets on it too early, it'll cause damage. So we're making sure that traffic too early doesn't cause stone to start flying off. And it says should not exceed 3%. So that's what we have in the specs. Usually once it turns black, so it'll go from a brown as the water and the uh, asphalt start to separate, it starts to break. It'll go from a brown where it's breaking to a black when it's setting. And generally by that time you've got enough strength and stiffness in that binder to allow it to be open to traffic. Micro definitely can carry it once it's black. These are a little bit different emulsions or different engineered emulsions. So the micro where it's going needs to get open to traffic so it's going to turn black so we can get traffic on it. But again we're making sure that the traffic doesn't damage it. We also got to make sure that the pavement and the air temperature will allow the slurry and the micro to be applied. So if it's too hot, too hot being 90 or hotter, remember that one question on that practice finding the specs, 90 degrees, we're going to fog it just to cool that surface a little bit so then when we apply it we don't get quick breaks. The tack coat may be pre-wetted even with the micro so you're going to tack it before you come through with the micro. It may need pre-wetting just to bring the temperature down and air and surface temperatures are key and we'll talk about those in the specs in just a moment. Some other things just to look at, getting out, have a lot of crack sealing that's going to be done. Here we have a nice surface when we're all done but what we're making sure of is see here we have a road, we're trying to keep the traffic off of it. These intersecting roads can cause a lot of problems because cars will want to go across it and sometimes we'll end up putting a light gritting on it so it won't damage the micro or the latex. Open it too soon, definitely in high traffic areas can cause a problem. Unfortunately, like most things, it's very dependent on the weather. So dry times will fluctuate early in the season where it's cooler, may take more time to dry or to break and cure versus in the middle of the summer when it's extremely hot it'll go much faster. So you have to understand what your temperatures are and how it's going to impact that slurry or that latex. And again we're going to protect areas with sand or other fine aggregates definitely in the uncured spots so tires don't pick up the material and take it away and damage the surface. So that's the general inspections of what you're going to look for but let's talk about each spec itself. We're going to look at first the lab requirements one thing to know is slurry seal mix designers don't have to be certified. So there's not a certification process like we have with other materials. Contractor supplies the mix design data on a TL-127. They also provide a compatibility test for per VTM-60, making sure the asphalt emulsion and the aggregate uh, like each other, that it'll bond. And then they do wet track abrasion results to make sure that under traffic it doesn't wear and come apart. Some of the paving material related requirements though is we got to do a test strip to make sure that mix is consistent. We want to get everything right 
before we go and do a large uh, paving project. So we have ISA Bulletin 106 is what we follow and really what we're looking for consistency wise of two and a half centimeters plus or minus a half a centimeter. So when this cone test, and we'll show you a photo here in a few minutes of when you do it, you're looking to see how far a known uh, amount of material spreads. If it doesn't spread very far, it's too stiff. If it spreads too far beyond, say, three centimeters of this piece of paper, then it's too loose, it's too wet, and we need to make adjustments. During production, we're doing again at least once in the first 25,000 square yards, and we're checking AC content. And then once per 50,000, again, we're checking AC content because we've got that mix design. Maybe it's at seven and a half or eight percent. We got to check it periodically per these frequencies to make sure that that's what we're getting. Slurry mixtures taken from the discharge chute, so we're getting it back at the machine to take to the lab. We're going to do a two consistency test per day and then really when directed by the engineers when we're going to do that wet track. So while we have it in the specs, really we're performing it when the engineer says we need to go do this wet track abrasion test. Here's that consistency test. Notice we got a piece of paper. We got rings at one centimeter spacing. So we got one, two, three, four, five. Remember I said it was two and a half plus or minus a half. So we're looking to be in this area. Notice how stiff this mix is. Here, we're right about two and a half to three. So this is what you're looking for. You can see they did their averages. They went around three, two, two, three. They did the calculation, said it was at two and a half within spec. If it was out here to beyond three, and the average was beyond three, the mix is too loose and it needs to be adjusted. Maybe it has a little bit too much water in it. Maybe some other things need to be adjusted with the mix design. Equipment related specs. Slurry unit must be capable of operating 60 feet per minute and store a minimum of five tons of slurry mix. So that's an equipment requirement. It's gotta be calibrated showing the gate settings so we'll make sure they get the right application rate. And you gotta have an 18 inch burlap drag on the spreader box for that final texture. Some general procedures that we need to make sure of. Existing pavement's got to be cleaned, so we're brooming it, compressed air. If we have a lot of debris, when we go across it, the new slurry will stick to that debris, and then it'll come right off the road. So we want a good, clean surface of the existing pavement before we do this. Surface temperature is too hot, we're at 90 degrees. We're going to do a light fog at about 0.05 gallons per square yard. And again, we're not flooding the pavement, we're just trying to cool it off so when we do this work, it doesn't cause it to break quickly. Slurry shall not be placed in puddled water or surfaces less than 50 degrees. Puddled water, as you can imagine, as we spray this emulsion and put the uh, uh, slurry in it, it's gonna really elevate the water content, cause problems. And if it's too cold, that slurry mixture doesn't break very quickly. It'll come apart. So we have that 50 degree minimum. And we don't want to do it where it could freeze in the next 24 hours. Because even though it may have broken, we can put traffic on it. If it freezes, it'll cause some micro cracks and eventually cause that slurry to fail. So that's why you're not doing any slurry operations when it's predicted to freeze within a day. Some other general procedures, we're doing this at full lane width up to 12 feet. We want to make sure that it ends at brake lines, so at the center line of a road between lanes. We would want to minimize excessive buildup. We got to keep the traffic off of it, and if any areas that uh, are damaged due to traffic, damaged due to contractor operations, whatever it may be, they're required to repair it. So the contractors protecting that pavement for a while until it breaks. Some other things to keep in mind, we have minimum application rates. So we have our type A, B, and C slurries. Our A and B, it's at least 16 pounds per square yard. Our type C is a minimum of 20. If you recall, that all goes back to the size of the aggregate. 
The contractor's got to provide daily aggregate weigh tickets, a daily delivery summary, as well as aggregate lost or not used because not going to pay for what's not out there. And final payments based on square yards and the price adjustments based on residual asphalt content and on application rate. Do we need to apply a price adjustment? Well, let's look at a couple things. First, on the slurry seal, you need to know what the total asphalt used in the residual asphalt is on a project. So if you look in your spec documents, we're going to talk about total, but we're also going to talk about residual. That total asphalt and the residuals provided on your certified way ticket. So what you get from the contractor should have this information. You must know the AC content from your approved job mix formula. You must know how many tons of aggregate was actually used on the route. Not delivered, but how much was used. So you have to uh, subtract any material not used or waste on the job. The actual AC content is just taking this residual and dividing it by the actual tons of aggregate used. So that gives you your actual AC content. And then you're just calculating actual versus job mix. So if your actual is 8% and your job mix is 8.2, that's what you're comparing against. And we're only doing a price adjustment on that square yard price if we're more than 1% the job mix formula. So there's a tolerance. So let's go back to that example. Say our job mix formula is 8.5. The contractor allowed by spec to go as low as 7.5 but once they're more than seven and a half percent, more than seven and a half percent below, so maybe they're 7.4, 7.3, that's where this clause of the spec comes into play. But if they're seven and a half to eight and a half, then no price adjustment is required. So just like we have price adjustments for asphalt content, we have price adjustments for aggregate. The slurry seals adjustments based on ton, total tonnage applied. The total aggregate on the way tickets comes certified, so they're coming across certified scales, but you've got to remove that used, or I mean that waste or that unused material back at the stockpile. You have to know what the application rate is for that route. That's going to be in your contract document. So it can be 16, 17, 18 pounds. So you need to know what that is, but then you also have to calculate the actual application rate. So how do you do that? You know what the total aggregate is minus what was not used. So that's the number of tons. You have to convert that over to pounds. So you just take, say it's 4,000 uh, tons, convert it over to pounds, and then divide it by the total area. And that just gets you pounds per square yard. And another module will cover paving math related to this spec and how this process is handled. Spec says price adjustment for every pound below the contract rate. So if we do all the calculations and the contract called for 18 and the contractor provided 18 or 19, then they're within spec. But if they provided 17 or 16, they're below the contract rate, so there's a price adjustment for each one. So for every pound, there's a 3% price adjustment per square yard. And again, the math will be covered in another module. What happens if the aggregate and AC price adjustments are required? You have to go through that same process and now you're adjusting the overall unit cost. So you calculate what it is for asphalt, you calculate what it is for aggregate, you add those and subtract it from that contract cost, and now you have your adjusted unit cost. Again, we'll get into the specifics in another module but this is how the contract specs work. For latex, it's a lot of the same things. We call it latex, we call it latex modified emulsion treatment, we'll call it microsurfacing. But as we look at those specs, again, mixture is designed and approved by the department, but just like with slurry, there's no certification within VDOT for that process. Similar materials provided, the TL-127 has the mix design, we got to do the compatibility test to make sure everything likes each other. So you're looking, does the latex, aggregate, and emulsion by the Shoals uh, Bear test come and pass? We do Marshall stability, that's a little different. 
It goes back to some old mixed design processes, but we're looking at per VTM 95. Is it a stable material? And then the AC content at four seven air voids, or six five for rut filling. So we're checking the asphalt content for that gradations that results in those types of design air voids. But again, this is all handled by the contractor, and they're the ones who's supplying that mixed design to the department. The department's not going back and verifying the designs or not redoing the designs. That's the responsibility of the contractor. Some general equipment related things, self-propelled front end continuous loading and mixing machine. We showed a video a little bit earlier of that continuous mixing machine as we passed over it. We passed over the paver, then we passed over the latex machine, then we passed over the aggregate. So it's a continuous feed, mobile unit, unless you're in a small area of 15,000 square yards or less. Again, it's got to be able to move at least 60 feet per minute because you're keeping this process rolling along. Minimum of five tons capacity. You got to calibrate it to make sure that you're achieving that residual asphalt content because that machine's mixing the aggregate and the emulsion together. And that pneumatic tire roller is needed to seat the aggregate. Or the pneumatic tire roller, if needed, to seat the aggregate into the emulsion. Some other things that you need to keep in mind. Existing pavement, again, has got to be clean. It's got to be broomed, maybe uh, blown off with compressed air. We only need to do that fogging if necessary in front of the tacking. The tack coats a CSS1H. It's diluted and it's applied at a light rate of 0.05 gallons. Remember that latex, we're doing it full lane width, but no more than a four inch overlap. We're also making sure we match on lane lines. Some of those pictures from earlier in this presentation, I showed where those lane lines or those edges and joints weren't. They need to follow your skip lines. They need to follow the edge of the pavement, not be anywhere randomly. Again, latex, we're not doing it on puddled surfaces. We're not doing it when it's a cold surface because again, we need these emulsions to break. And just with slurry surfacing, if it's going to be below freezing within 24 hours, we're not to lay it. Some other related requirements, the contractor daily has got to provide way tickets on the aggregate, a delivery summary, an aggregate lost or not used, and then final payment for slurry, I mean for latex, is based on the number of tons of material and it's adjusted on the residual asphalt content. We're doing testing, AC on a 500 ton sampling rate. So again, it's being collected, taken back to the lab to check the AC content for, compared to that mixed design. The AC has to be within plus or minus 1.5%. And if two tests fail or one exceeds 2%, then the unit must be removed from service. So if that mixing unit and that uh, latex train cannot provide this level of consistency and it exceeds 2% at any time, it's got to be removed from surface. The price adjustment for latex is slightly different than slurry surfacing. Again, it's based on the total asphalt used and the residual asphalt content. The total asphalt is coming on that certified way ticket. You have to know what's in the job mix. So is it 9.5%? Is it 9.7%? You need to know what that is. You got to know how many tons of aggregate used so you can do the calculations. You're taking, for an actual AC content, you need that residual and that total tons used to calculate actual AC content. And then our price adjustments are comparing our actual to our job mix. So if we're more than 1% below that job mix AC content, then there's a price adjustment for every 0.1%. So that's the specs related to the, surf, or the slurry surfacing and the latex micro. Let's talk about the quality assurance program briefly. Quality assurance program is set up in the Code of Federal Regulations for Federal Highway says states that use contractor test results for payment purposes has to have a QA program. Contractors part of this program as well as VDOT. Our main con 
components is quality control, so those processes the contractor follows to make sure that they're delivering the product as specified. There's the acceptance testing. So how's it paid for? Does the contractor do all the acceptance testing? Does the department or owner do testing? Who does that really impacts how uh, it's calculated? For these materials, the acceptance part of it goes back to VDOT checking the materials, taking it back to the labs, doing AC contents and other tests. There's independent assurance. So the IA part just makes sure that everybody that's doing it can do it properly. We all have verification, sampling, and testing. So if we're doing comparisons, VDOT compared to contractor, this is a process that says, all right, we're using contractor's test results. VDOT's going to come in and do an independent check to do a verification sampling test that if the contractor's result, results say it passed, does VDOT's independence results show that it passed. That's just a real brief on the QA program. It's more in depth with asphalt and other materials, but it is a portion of this overall surface treatment and slurry, I mean, it is a part of this overall slurry surfacing and latex program. But let's summarize. Existing pavement has to be in good condition for these to be effective treatments. We're not putting these on pavements that are beat up because the life of those pavements are gone. So it's a preventive maintenance treatment. Temperature is critical. If it's too hot, we need to cool the surface down at 90 degrees, but if it's below 50, we're not doing it either. Slurry seal, we're paying everything by the square yard. Latex, by the ton. And just like our other materials, there are potential price adjustments if the contractor doesn't supply what was in that contract document. And with that, that's all the different specs, the QA program, there's a knowledge check at the end of this chapter. Take some time, answer those questions. All the information is in your chapter as well as in those spec uh, specification documents. If you have any questions, talk to your facilitator. Thanks and good luck.